know that most of what you've seen, read, or heard about Billy the Kid is untrue? My name is Gail Cooper. I'm a medical doctor and forensic psychiatrist. My specialty is murder case consultation for the defense. For 20 years, I've used my expertise to uncover the real Billy the Kid. Researching over 40,000 pages of archival documents and books, I've written the revisionist history. It's shocking, it's liberating, and I've written books demolishing the hoaxes, hijacking the history. My talks will share with you what I've found. Cover-ups, misinformation, and fakery, to use Old West lingo, will bite the dust. This talk gives my revisionist history perspective on Governor Lou Wallace, who betrayed his pardon bargain with Billy Bonney. The information is from my book, The Lost Pardon of Billy the Kid. In late 1878, other than Billy Bonney, Lou Wallace was the most unusual man in New Mexico territory. The coming together of Billy as the Lincoln County War's last freedom fighter, and Wallace, as a Civil War general still fighting his own demons, had implications for Billy's pardon and the future of New Mexico territory. The complexity of new territorial Governor Lou Wallace, who replaced Santa Fe ring beholden Samuel Beach Axtell, must have confused one-dimensional ringites their gluttonous goals were just money and power. He was a Civil War major general, a graphic artist, a best-selling author of an historical novel, The Fair God, about conquistador Hernando Cortez, and a prosecuting attorney who hanged Abraham Lincoln's murder conspirators. He was then writing a novel titled Ben-Hur about the coming of Jesus Christ. On screen is Lou Wallace as governor of New Mexico Territory from late 1878 to 1881. Lou Wallace could have changed the course of New Mexico history by fulfilling his 1879 pardon bargain with Billy Bonney. Granting it would have confirmed that Billy's Lincoln County War killings of William Brady, George Hindman, and Andrew Buckshot Roberts were justifiable in the regulators' freedom fight against the Santa Fe Ring. Unfortunately, just then, that corrupt cabal was not only denying its role in the Lincoln County War, but also its very existence. Wallace realized the pardon would destroy his political career. He wrote to a Civil War friend on November 14, 1878, I came here and found a ring with a hand on the throat of the territory. I refused to join them, and now they are proposing to fight me in the Senate for removal as governor. In my novel, Billy and Paulita, I had Billy's fellow Tunstall employee, half Chickasaw Fred Waite, tell him, Lincoln County is a moral proving ground Evil here is so powerful, it breaks people where they're weakest. I'll present Lou Wallace's biography to show why he broke. Noteworthy is that Wallace's psyche was surprisingly similar to Billy Bonney's, having been formed by traumas of early parental death, unusual talents, and abandonment even though from birth, Wallace and Billy were at opposite ends of America's class system. Their lives were a search for a father figure and for acceptance. Lou Wallace's affectionate biographers are Robert and Catherine Morseberger in their 1980 book, 
Lou Wallace, militant, romantic. And Wallace's autobiography was published posthumously in 1906. Lewis Wallace was born in Brookville, Indiana on April 10th, 1827, 54 years plus one day before Billy Bonney's conviction for first degree murder for lack of his pardon. Wallace is West Point educated, lawyer father David Wallace became Indiana's lieutenant governor when Lewis was five. There were three more brothers, with one of them dying in childhood. Child Lewis was a book-loving, irresponsible dreamer. His unapproving, cruel father punished him by whippings. His mother punished oddly by tying him to a bed frame and dressing him in her clothes. He was eight when she died and his father abandoned him to a neighbor. At nine, he moved with his older brother to Crawfordsville, Indiana. His father then remarried without telling him. The traumas left Lewis resenting authority figures and he identified with his sadistic father. So he later rebelled against orders and was pitiless to those in his power. In 1837, when Lewis was 10, his father became Indiana's governor and moved the family to Indianapolis. By then, Lewis enjoyed illustrating. David Wallace scorned it as a feat. In 1838, David enabled massacre of 150 Potawatomi Indians who refused a legal relocation. By the 1840s, David returned to private law practice and abandoned Lewis to an aunt. At 15, Lewis wrote his first novel, set in Jerusalem during the Crusades. His hero, after wartime heroism, is accepted by the heroine's father as Lewis longed for his father's acceptance. At 16, Lewis ran away to join a real war, Texas's War of Independence. Caught, he faced his furious father, who abandoned him again by cutting off all support. So Wallace took odd jobs. At 17, he apprenticed as a lawyer but in two years, Mexican-American war fervor seized him and he raised a company. In Mexico, he revealed his elitist prejudices. On March 26, 1846, he wrote to his brother William. The native Mexican in his ignorance and mental imbecility bears the same relation to Spaniards as the imported African to us. Their minds, like the Indians, are entirely composed of cunning, low trickery, and inclinations to deceit. By 1847, Wallace was back in Indiana without seeing battle. He wrote in his autobiography that he felt no qualms about the rightness of that war. His sole focus was himself. He wrote in his autobiography, my noblest dream of life has been one of fame. In 1849, he got his law license. In 1852, he married wealthy Susan Elston from Crawfordsville, Indiana. Her never wavering adulation of him matched his own. In the 1850s, the Republican Party formed with abolishing slavery as its cause. Though Wallace backed owners' rights, he joined the Union side. In 1856, he organized the Crawfordsville Militia and was elected state senator. In 1859, seeing the Stephen A. Douglas and Abraham Lincoln debate, he chose Lincoln as a father figure and became a Republican. Wallace's benefactor was Indiana's governor, Oliver P. Morton. 
after the April 13, 1861 attack on Fort Sumner, Wharton made Wallace an adjutant general in charge of raising troops. Wallace chose command as a colonel of the 11th Regiment of Indiana Volunteers, and he renamed himself as Lou. By June, his regiment had a successful skirmish which he initiated without orders in Romney, West Virginia. When his enlistment period ended, Wallace mustered a new regiment by August of 1861. He reported to Brigadier General Charles F. Smith. At 34, Wallace became a Brigadier General of Volunteers. In 1862, he was promoted to Major General. Then Smith died on April 25, 1862, after an accidental fall when visiting Wallace before the Battle of Shiloh. Smith was replaced by Ulysses S. Grant for that Tennessee battle. It began on April 6, 1862. It resulted in Wallace's unhealable trauma. On the first day of fighting, Daydreamer Wallace got lost on the way to the battle at Pittsburgh Landing, only a half mile away. He never arrived with his 7,500 troops. Grant and General William Tecumseh Sherman were under fierce attack by Confederate General Albert Sidney Johnston. The next day, Wallace arrived and assisted victory, but Grant held him responsible for the Union's near loss and the battle's horrific total of 23,746 casualties. That exceeded the total casualties of the combined Revolutionary War, the War of 1812, and the Mexican-American War. In June, Grant removed Wallace from any command. Wallace went back to Crawfordsville, humiliated, denying blame, and begging Grant for a pardon. In 17 years, he'd face Billy Bonney petitioning for a pardon. His own pardon withheld would combine with his sadistic power to repeat that injury on this dependent boy. In August of 1862, Wallace's sympathetic backer, Indiana Governor Morton, got him sent by himself to Cincinnati, Ohio. Heading there, coincidentally, were also Confederate troops under General Kirby Smith. When Wallace found out, he made a proclamation forcing the inhabitants to defend their city. That worked but it did not eradicate the curse of Shiloh. And he impulsively tried to hang some Cincinnati citizens he imagined as Confederate spies. Through 1863, Wallace obsessively sought pardon from Grant. Only President Lincoln's intervention saved him from removal from service. For Lincoln's 1864 re-election, Wallace was sent to Baltimore, Maryland to protect polling places by his military presence. There, he hysterically tried to hang four possibly innocent men whom he called Confederate spies. Lincoln stopped him. In 1864, Wallace was directing secret aid to Mexican President Benito Juarez fighting French colonizing forces. But Wallace additionally fantasized that the French were colluding with Texan Confederates to create an independent empire in Texas. So he drew up an amnesty proclamation for the Confederates, thinking he'd beat Grant in uniting the country. But it was rejected by the Confederates, 
And by May 26, 1864, they surrendered anyway. Then, on April 15, 1865, President Lincoln was assassinated. New President Andrew Johnson appointed Wallace as a prosecutor for the conspirators' trial, the assassin John Wilkes Booth having been killed. In the trial, Wallace was accused of suppressing defense evidence and permitting perjury to attain the July 7th hangings of Lewis Powell, David, Harold, George Astorot, and John Wilkes Booth's probably innocent landlady, Mary Surratt, the first woman hanged by the federal government. And before her hanging, Wallace cruelly rejected her pardon petition. He next succeeded in hanging the Confederate Andersonville prison camps Captain Henry Wirtz, and he tried to hang Confederate President Jefferson Davis. On November 30th, 1865, Wallace left the army. To his killed wartime battle adversaries, he had added five hangings while trying for many more. So in the war and its aftermath, Lew Wallace was connected to the killing of thousands. Sadistic power balanced Shiloh's impotence. Wallace returned to Crawfordsville with limited finances and fear of failure at 40. In 1868, he tried politics, losing a seat in Congress amidst bad press about his hanging innocent Mary Surratt and his enemy, Ulysses S. Grant was by then president. In 1870, Wallace tried again for seat in Congress, losing to attacks about Shiloh and Surratt. In 1872, Wallace campaigned for Grant's reelection, though Grant ignored his continuing pleas for a Shiloh pardon. Grant also refused his request for an ambassadorship. Wallace returned to writing. His historical novel, The Fair God, A Tale of the Conquest of Mexico, became a bestseller. In 1876, Wallace campaigned for Republican presidential hopeful Rutherford B. Hayes. Hayes defeated anti-ring Democrat Samuel Tilden in a tainted election. Wallace was responsible. He was legal counsel for its Florida recount. Wallace got the canvassing board to throw out Tilden's leading votes to declare Hayes the winner. Wallace made Hayes president. The press called it the crime of 76. Wallace then asked Hayes for a payback of an exotic ambassadorship to Italy, Brazil, Spain, or Mexico. While waiting in Crawfordsville, he worked on his cathartic book, Ben-Hur, with its hero struggling to get a pardon from unjust accusation and enslavement by a high Roman official. Wallace was reworking Shiloh into a tale of salvation. In August of 1878, Hayes offered him a Bolivian ambassadorship. He refused it. That month, he submitted a plan to Secretary of War George McCrary for exterminating Native Americans, like his father's massacre of Potawatomi's Indians. Possibly, that appealed to Hayes, who offered him the governorship of territorial New Mexico that month. It was the remainder of removed Ringite Governor Samuel Beach Axtell's term. Wallace accepted. He had attained his father's level of public office. 
and it merged his airy fantasies of old Mexico and the western frontier. The territory's desperate, ring-terrorized citizens would soon become just fodder for his continuing narcissistic saga of his own life. Wallace was briefed in Washington on September 13th by Secretary of the Interior Carl Schurz, to whom he would report, and investigator Frank Warner Angel forced to cover up the Santa Fe Ring in his 1878 reports about the Ring's part in murdering John Tunstall and in the Lincoln County War, secretly gave him his notebook listing Ringites and an 1877 pamphlet by a Mary McPherson listing Thomas Benton Catron as Ring Head and the Ringites' crimes. But Wallace had no interest in laboring for justice. He intended rapid quieting of the territory, keeping his wife Susan and son Henry amused in boring Santa Fe, finishing Ben-Hur, making some mining investments, and leaving quickly to an exotic ambassadorship. Wallace arrived in Santa Fe on September 30, 1878. He was sworn in as the territory's 11th governor on October 1st. Immediately, he tried unsuccessfully to get Hayes to declare martial law so he could hang all troublemakers. He then focused on renovating his official residence, the Palace of the Governors, and completing Ben-Hur. He ignored annoying letters from an attorney named Houston Chapman representing a widow named Susan McSween against a Fort Stanton commander named N.A.M. Dudley for arson and murder in the Lincoln County War. Wallace had no interest in visiting Little Lincoln Town's complaining citizens. On November 13th, for a quick fix, he issued an amnesty proclamation for non-indicted civilians and soldiers from the Lincoln County War. With his elitism, he even conferred with Catherine himself, whose office was in the same plaza as the Palace of the Governors. Catherine's henchman, U.S. Marshal John Sherman, had already provided Wallace with an outlaw list. It had mostly regulators. Billy was number 14 as a murderer named The Kid, William Bonney. So, as another quick fix, Wallace used troops to try and apprehend so-called outlaws, whom he fabricated as causing the unrest. Billy evidently got extra rain promotion, so Wallace offered an astronomical $1,000 dead or alive reward for him. That's almost $28,000 today. Then came February 18, 1879. The ring murdered Houston Chapman in Lincoln to stop his prosecution of Dudley. In March, grudging Wallace arrived there. He tried another quick fix by removing Dudley as Fort Stan's commander. That didn't work. In Dudley's corner was Catron. Catron faked Dudley in the press as a noble officer insulted by Wallace. Dudley was no grand, but to vulnerable Wallace, Shiloh's specter loomed again with added anxiety about failure as governor in the eyes of father figures, Hayes and Schwartz. Right then, Wallace heard from teenage Billy Bonney, cocky enough to propose a pardon deal as part of his own compulsive quest for a father and acceptance. It was a March 13th letter bargaining to give his eyewitness testimony against Chapman's murderers in exchange for a pardon, 
for his Lincoln County War indictments for the regulators' killings of Brady, Hinman, and Roberts. Wallace should have seen it as a godsend, and he had no qualms about giving pardons. He would soon turn a blind eye when Boss Catron, colluding with ring-eyed Judge Warren Bristol, used his amnesty proclamation to pardon all ring-eyed murderers and arsonists, even though they were excluded from it by being indicted. He met with Billy on March 17th in the Lincoln home of Justice of the Peace, John Squire Wilson. But there was a clash of personalities and politics. Billy was unintimidated by elitist Wallace. That brought out Wallace's sadism. And Wallace knew enough about the Lincoln County War to know Billy's pardon would pit him against the Santa Fe Ring. So he went through the motions without intent. But Billy believed they had made a deal and submitted to sham jailing in Lincoln. Howe's next door, Board Wallace amused himself by interviewing Billy about local outlawry, avoiding questions about the Lincoln County War. But Billy followed up with a letter on the war's specifics. Then Billy testified against Chapman's murderers and got them indicted. No pardon followed. Next, on his own, Billy testified for the prosecution in Commander Dudley's Court of Inquiry. Wallace also testifying against Dudley was exposed as an incompetent governor by Ringite defense attorney Henry Waldo. As if reliving Shiloh, humiliated Wallace retreated to Santa Fe and thereafter ignored Lincoln County and Billy's pardon. Dudley was exonerated by the rig court. That furthered Wallace's avoidance of confronting the powerful ring. In January of 1880, hypocrite Wallace announced to the legislature that he had restored peace in Lincoln County. In truth, its citizens had sunk into hopeless silence as the ring flourished unchecked. And he completed Ben-Hur, an immediate bestseller. In September of 1880, Wallace took a two-month leave to campaign for James Garfield's presidential bid. On December 22nd, he placed a newspaper reward notice of $500 for Billy the Kid, what the Ring's outlaw myth had named Billy. In 1881, elected Garfield offered Wallace the ambassadorship to Turkey. Intending to escape his hated governorship early, Wallace still had to face his pardon promise to Billy. He had ignored captured Billy's January to March of 1881 pardon plea letters from the Santa Fe jail. He hoped to hide his betrayal by Billy's hanging death. On April 13th, he issued his own gubernatorial death sentence for Billy for Sheriff Pat Garrett. On April 28th, he gave a newspaper interview lying that he didn't pardon Billy because it was undeserved. Coincidentally, Billy escaped jail that day, so on May 3rd, Wallace made a second $500 newspaper reward offer for Billy the Kid. But Wallace, unlike Ringites, had some conscience. Burying his guilt at betraying Billy triggered his lifelong compulsive fictions outlawing Billy and making himself the hero who was the object of outlaw Billy's murderous obsession. That projected his own wish to kill Billy. On May 16th, in the St. Louis Daily Globe Democrat, 
Wallace published his bizarre dime novel fantasy of Billy's outlaw gang titled The Thug's Territory. Stage robbers and cutthroats have things their own way in New Mexico. General Lou Wallace, anxious to punish the crime that is so prevalent. A chapter about Billy the Kid. On May 28th, Wallace left the territory, but he could not escape his obsession with Billy. On June 18th, in the Crawfordsville Saturday Evening Journal, he presented Billy the Kid. General Wallace tells why the young desperado of New Mexico wanted to kill him. By the end of June, Wallace and his wife were on a boat en route to Constantinople and his ambassadorship. Billy had two weeks left to live because of his betrayal. From 1881 through 1885, Wallace entered his own romantic tales as ambassador to Turkey. He toured Jerusalem, Cairo, and Rome. On September 19, 1881, President Garfield was assassinated. In 1884, Wallace, with his wife, took a leave to campaign for Republican James Blaine for president. Then, the ghost of Shiloh rose again. Century Magazine ran articles on the Civil War. Ulysses S. Grant would cover Shiloh. Wallace again pleaded with him for its pardon. But Grant, dying of throat cancer, damned him with a magazine and his memoir. He wrote, Wallace did not arrive in time to take part in the first day's fight. General Wallace has since claimed that the order delivered to him was simply to join the right of the army, but this is not where I ordered him nor where I wanted him to go. I never could see and do not know why any order was necessary further than to direct him to come to Pittsburgh Landing. In 1886, Wallace returned from Constantinople to Crawfordsville, Indiana. He toured the country, giving talks on his romanticized adventures. In 1893, using his Near East experience, he wrote another bestseller, The Prince of India, or Why Constantinople Fell. In 1893, Shiloh rose again. It was at a veterans' reunion where Wallace gave a speech claiming he was unfairly blamed. In 1901, he went to Shiloh's battlefield and tried unsuccessfully to get the Shiloh Military Park Commission to present his version of the first day. He returned in 1903 for the 41st anniversary of the battle and gave a speech vindicating himself. Likewise, continuing into the 20th century, was Wallace's obsessive lying about Billy and the pardon in novella-like articles. He now admitted to the pardon promise, but he lied that Billy ruined the bargain by continued outlawry. On June 23, 1900, in the Indianapolis Press, was his General Wallace's feud with Billy the Kid when the general was governor of New Mexico and Billy Bonney was the most dangerous Western outlaw. On June 8, 1902, in the New York World magazine, was his general Lou Wallace writes a romance of Billy the Kid, most famous bandit of the plains, thrilling story of the midnight meeting between General Wallace, then governor of New Mexico, and the notorious outlaw in a lonesome hut in Santa Fe. Billy also appeared in Wallace's late life autobiography as an outlaw obsessed with killing him in revenge for his denying the pardon. And if death had not cut Wallace short, 
in 1905, Billy the Kid would have likely become an outlaw and serial murderer in a novel on the Old West in which Wallace himself was the hero. In the summer of 1904, Wallace was declining with stomach cancer, but he opposed the Senate bill combining New Mexico and Arizona territories, announcing hypocritically, I love the people of New Mexico. I lived with them for two and a half years as their governor, and I know their condition and their needs. So Wallace broke where he was weakest, monumental selfishness. It topped off his elitism, racism, authoritarianism, narcissism, sadism, and hypocrisy in an ironic twist that would have shocked him. The fame that he craved and got ended up eclipsed by his homeless, penniless, low-class victim, Billy Bonney. Wallace died on February 15, 1905, at 77. His self-aggrandizing autobiography was completed in 1906 by his wife. As a postscript, Lou Wallace's wife, Susan, his son, Henry, and Henry's son, Lou Wallace Jr., preserved all his papers, including those of Billy the Kid. And when donating them as the Lou Wallace Collection to the Indiana Historical Society and the Bloomington, Indiana Lilly Library, Lou Wallace Jr. saved two items from the thousands of pages. Billy Bonney's first pardon plea letter of March 13, 1879, and Billy's Santa Fe jail letter of March 2, 1881. Lou Wallace must have let it be known to his kin that there was something special about them. William N. Wallace, Lou Wallace's great-grandson and Lou Wallace Jr.'s son, sold those two letters to a historical museum in Lincoln, New Mexico. That same William N. Wallace in 2010 helped me to stop a modern Santa Fe Ring Governor's publicity stunt pardon for Billy the Kid to be granted to an old-timer Billy the Kid imposter named Oliver Brushy Bill Roberts. So Lou Wallace's descendant helped me save Billy Bonney's history after his great-grandfather helped the ring destroy Billy Bonney's life. In upcoming talks, I'll discuss Billy Bonney's lost pardon. In later talks, I'll discuss the 20th century Billy the Kid imposter hoax of Brushy Bill Roberts and its 21st century rerun by New Mexico's corrupt governor. <laughs>